Howdy folks! Welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is the place for news and reviews of all things sci-fi and fantasy with a special focus on that most awesome of genres, steampunk. Just my hat here. So, today our topic is one suggested by one of our awesome viewers and that is literary steampunk. Now, as much as I love steampunk, I have never thought of it as being a particularly literally a particularly <laughs> literary genre. Nor have I been really a big fan of the literary scene. It always seemed to be rather arbitrary to me. And uh, I've been more into genre fiction, uh, whether it's sci-fi, whether it's westerns, uh, mysteries, all of those things, detective novels, spy novels. Uh, so I've always been more of a fan of, of novels, of fiction that's fun, rather than it's too serious. And sci-fi has not been traditionally considered literary either, for that matter. Now, it's interesting that a lot of what is considered classic literature could easily be classified as sci-fi, but it isn't. And that's, I think, because the literary circles have recognized it as being something valuable, so they don't want to call it sci-fi, because that would kind of defeat their um, superiority complex. So, novels like 1984 and, and Brave New World, for example, are just considered dystopian, even though by all practical means they would be science fiction, because they involve a technology, like the telescreen or uh, the drugs of, of uh, Soma and so on in Brave New World, and they are very speculative on, you know, this weird, awful societies that they, that they portray. Uh, there's also some other, other situations where uh, literary people, the academics and so on, will make another, carve out another exception for stuff that's speculative and imaginative, and that's the idea of magical realism. And I think I've, I've got to do a segment on magical realism one of these days. However, <laughs> however, I haven't really read enough of it, so, uh, so that's uh, something that will have to wait until another day. Magical realism involves, you know, adding fantasy elements to everyday type situations and stories, and it's often done by people from other countries, you know, other than, you know, U.S. or Britain or so on, and they are involve, and when they include people like uh, Murakami from Japan, I have read some of his stuff really good, 1Q84, I recently read that huge novel, and people like Borges from Argentina, or Salman Rushdie from well, he's from Britain, but he's of, of uh, I believe, Pakistani or Indian descent. And, uh, of course, his book, The Satanic Verses, caused a lot of stir in the world. So that's considered magical realism, even though it, it would be probably considered fantasy in most situations. So I've always, like I, like I said, I've always thought that um, the, whatever, whatever was considered literary was kind of arbitrary. And Samuel Delaney, a great sci-fi writer, once observed that uh, sci-fi was one of the, one of those despised genres, along with erotica and comic books, <laughs> and that he had written two of the three. <laughs> so that's something that that's something that I always took with me as kind of badge of a badge of pride that sci-fi was not considered that literary. However, there are some writers that are really good, and there are. Sometimes a mainstream writer will venture into sci-fi, and that's often you know, accepted by the literary uh, elitists. And at other times, I think that at other times the um, there are certain there are certain qualifications or certain features that are usually present in literary fiction, as far as I can tell. And a sci-fi novel that does exhibit these features would rightfully be considered literary uh, because because you know genre it doesn't really mean anything especially since we as I've said they can they have workarounds for that if they if they don't if they don't if they want to praise something from a disfavored genre they just invent a new one so what are the features of a literary of, of a literary novel well I would consider one of them to be slower pacing usually and more symbolism. Uh, the endings are often ambiguous, sometimes unsatisfying. Not that that's always a bad thing. Sometimes we want that kind of kind of book. There's 
often a political message, usually, usually leftist, <laughs> usually progressive or leftist, and most importantly, I think, is the idea of an eloquence versus economy of language. For example, if you take a Michael Crichton novel, and I recently read his book Timeline, which is about time travel, it's a very well-written novel, and it, and it works very well. The action moves forward, it, it, keeps, you, it keeps you reading, it, it's exciting, but he's not as into the poetic language as a lot of people would be. And just as an example of a sci-fi writer who's into the poetic stuff would be Samuel Delaney, as I mentioned before. Uh, if you've read any of his stuff, I was I recently read Babel 17 because of my talk on Saper Wharf, a uh, Sapir Wharf, excuse me, hypothesis, and Babel 17 was part of that. And and his writing is indeed it's very eloquent and very colorful, and it I would definitely class it as literary, no matter how despised he believes sci-fi is. So I collected a small number of sci-fi, no, of sci not just plain sci-fi, but steampunk novels that I think kind of fit the literary mold. And I'm going to talk about them today. First of all, it can often involve a author who is successful in the mainstream, and my first author in that list is Thomas Pynchon. He writes some pretty weird stuff, to be, to be perfectly frank, but it is, has been very acclaimed. I think his novels with their odd digressions and fantasy sequences, I think they would have been probably rejected back in the 1930s and 40s, but after the Beatnik era, when you know things like Ginsburg's Howl became popular and acclaimed, I think after that, you were able to experiment a little bit more. And Pynchon is one of those people. Long ago, I read his uh, 1973 book, Gravity's Rainbow, which is about, it's a historical novel about the period right after World War II, which was, which is very interesting. It's, it's a, a neglected period because everybody writes about the war. Anyway, it had a lot of odd stuff in it. And I haven't read anything else till I heard about a steampunk novel by him, or at least a historical novel, Against the Day, 2006, Penguin. Now, again, I, I, you can't pretend his books are all that normal. <laughs> and there is a lot of, there are fantasy sequences, there are characters with, with funny or ironic names, which I very much appreciate, and uh, there's a lot of kind of strange sexuality in there, so if you're easily offended, don't read Pynchon. <laughs> but uh, Against the Day is very long, but I consider it to be very masterful. It begins with the 1893 Chicago World's Fair and extends all the way to just after World War I. It's got a very diverse cast, uh, not so much ethnically as personality types and so on. A very diverse cast of characters that are very memorable and they come from all walks of life. And it's kind of loosely based on actual history. I think he did a lot of research in this, but it's got some magical realism thrown in there. And among the steampunk elements are, uh, there is a gang of teenage base adventurers who fly around an airship. And they're called the Chums of Chance. Love that name. And if it's airships, you know, it's got to be, it's got to be steampunk. And there's a nefarious British secret society known as TWIT, T-W-I-T, I don't remember what it stands for, but uh, it's conspiracies, that's big in steampunk, and finally, a cameo appearance by Nikola Tesla. <laughs> you have the trifecta. And so a considerable part of the story centers around a Col Colorado family uh, called, the, um, called the Travers, and uh, starting with the patriarch Webb Travers, and he's like a union agitator, almost a terrorist. <laughs> But I, I'm fascinated with this era because there, what we had the Colorado Labor Wars, and I actually wrote about these in my novel Fidelius Automata, and, and Tesla's in there too, of course. And, and it's, it's a time when they literally brought in troops to, like, fire on American citizens because they were so, you know, the elites were so afraid of what the unions might do in their rebellion. So, I just, I love this book. Again, a lot of strange sexuality. And uh, there was 
all these characters and they go through so many things. Just to think, just to know about the Chums of Trance, and, and they're the ones with the funniest names, like Darby Suckling, <laughs> and they have, they don't age. They're essentially a pulp, they're essentially characters from a, a theoretical pulp, no, uh, pulp novel series, or a fictional no, pulp novel series that might have been popular in that time. So they don't age, they, they stay teenagers. Even when they meet some of the characters, some of the other characters from the book who age normally, they get married, they have kids, they, they die, you know, but chumps of chance, you know, they're, they're immortal, it seems. Anyway, it, it's, if you like that kind of a long and complicated and very eloquent books, I, I highly recommend uh, Against the Day. Second one. This is a guy I talked about, I, I talked about in uh, my Alternate Histories segment. He's been very well acclaimed, and he does write science fiction, but they kind of recategorize it as the new weird. <laughs> I talked about his, his novella, um, Last Days in New Paris, in which, uh, you know, the Nazis and the Allies are fighting each other with magic, and uh, artworks come to life, and so on. His name is China Niedel. He's British, and he's, he's a hardcore Marxist, <laughs> and I think that's part, probably part of the reason that they, that they, um, carved out this exception for him. Nonetheless, I forgive him that, because some Marxists are really good writer, writers. And and uh, his book, Perdido Street Station, which I selected as one of my literary steampunk choices, is very, very good. It's long, it's complicated, lots of characters, very poetic, and it fits, it hits all those, hits all those marks of a literary work. It was part of a trilogy that take place in this world uh, of Balag, and there's a city, kind of a city-state, a lot like Victorian London, but it's called New Crozon. I found it very reminiscent of, of uh, Carnival Row. In fact, since this came first, way back in 2000, it, Carnival Row probably had some influence from Perdido Street Station. It's it's a kind of a very diverse take on Victorian London. Now, no matter what the revisionists try to make it, Victorian London was not a diverse place, for the most part. I mean, you'd have Irish, Scottish, maybe a few Americans thrown in there, but there was not many, all that many, there was not all that many people from India or the other colonies. You know, they just didn't, weren't all that welcome. Uh, so it's, it was very different from the modern London. But, uh, New Corpazon is a lot like modern London in that there are all these different races, and they're not different human races, they're different species. For example, there's the Kepri, which are like uh, giant, intelligent bug people. Uh, the Garuda, which is a... Um, the Garuda are a mythical... Uh, in Hindu mythology, mythology, they're a mythical race of bird people. And uh, the uh, Vojinoi, which are amphibians, kind of like frog people. And there's actually cactus people that, that walk around. <laughs> They're like plants. They walk around. They have spines and all that stuff, which is very cool, I thought, anyway. So the protagonist is a guy called Isaac Grimnebulin. And he is a kind of a mad scientist. He's an independent guy. He calls himself a dilettante. He tells, one of his, he tells his potential client, clients, I'm what you need because I'm a dilettante. I'm not, you know, with the implication that he's not, he's not going to be cowed by respectability. He'll do whatever it takes. And he get uh, he hooks up with a Garuda who has lost his wings. And the idea the Garuda wants him to develop a technology that can make him fly. So, so uh, Isaac discovers this new form of energy which he calls crisis energy, which is kind of like an old-fashioned idea of perpetual motion. Very interesting. And, you know, and magic kind of plays a part in this world. So it, it makes it more plausible. Isaac's girlfriend is a Kepri. She's a giant bug. They call her a ladybug. So I kind of imagined that she was a giant ladybug because I know ladybugs are more... We all, we humans like ladybugs, so I kind of envisioned her that way, even though she probably isn't. And she can't speak as a human does. She has to uh, sign with her antennae. And, she, of course, she can write. She's an artist. How they have relations, 
is beyond me. <laughs> and he doesn't really get into it, which kind of I was relieved about that. And so a lot of this centers around uh, Isaac's, Isaac's um, project to try and make uh, Yakarek the Gru to fly again. He collects birds and other winged creatures, trying to study them. Uh, some of the experiments are, a little, experiments are a little cruel, to say the least. But uh, he eventually accidentally gets this larva of a moth that turns out to be a monster. And they, these monsters, it grows up into a monster that flies through the skies of New Crobazon and it uh, lives on people's nightmares and it steals people's souls. So it and others like it are a menace that Isaac has to try and try and uh, stop. And he's got a, you know a, a gang of friends. Some are political radicals. Some are some are criminals. Um, and they're at the same time they're going against the government, which is very oppressive. Uh, male Red Gutter, another one, another awesome name. Mayor Red Gutter and uh, the militia who will shoot people down if a strike goes on for long, too long, etc. And uh, they're also trying to get rid of these slake moths, but it's Isaac who really has to has to do the job. Very interesting and uh, exciting book, even though it's more uh, slow paced and poet uh, poetic than a lot of a lot of adventure books. Third one, this is been called steampunk-ish. It's not really steampunk per se, it's, it's an urban fantasy, but it's got some steampunkish elements, so I'm going to include it, and it's by the great Neil Gaiman. And he has, his writing has always been very eloquent, and I consider him like the modern Charles Dickens. And I, and I love his work. This one's called Neverwhere, and was actually based on a BBC miniseries from 1996. This is a novelization of that. And the version I got was an audiobook where he narrates it himself and he does a fantastic job. I I just this is this is the guy I envy. This is the man who I want to be. <laughs> because he's worked on comics, he's done all these novels, he's done kids books, a Coraline, very spooky and wonderful. Uh, he's he's uh, can do voice acting and even so he's once he's once spoken about his insecurities. So it's kind of crazy when you think about some, a genius like that can feel insecure about his abilities. So Neverwhere is the story of Richard Mayhew. He's, a, he's like an accountant or something boring like that. He's from Scotland. He moves down to London for a promotion and he's got this very overbearing fiance and he's moving up in the world and his whole life come, comes unhinged because as he's out on the town with his his fiance, this, they, this young girl is running through the streets. She's all bleeding. She's injured. She's running for her life, and Richard insists on helping her. You know, the, the fiance says, no, just call, you know, just call the authorities and let them handle it. And, and Richard insists, though, and for that, his fiance gets so angry, she breaks up with him. And she's jealous. She thinks he wants to have, you know, she thinks he's sexually interested in this girl, but he's actually just a good guy. The girl, it turns out, her, his name, her name is Dor, and she's, she's got this magical ability to open doors. And she's from a mystical realm called London Below. London Below, on not just like the sewers, but the, there's this magic world down there that has a lot of historical elements, you know, some things left behind by the Romans. I mean, there's ancient creatures down here, and uh, they, uh, they talk in a very old-timey way and so on, and that's kind of the steampunkish element to that. Very colorful characters, like uh, the Marquis de Carabas, who has this colorful coat and he's very flamboyant. Uh, there's these two uh, evil guys, Mr. Croup and Mr. Vandemar, who are after Dor. They were trying to kill her whole family. And we we find out basically that they're immortal. You know, they've been around since the Roman times. Although they sound like a couple of villains right out of Dickens. And there's vampire-like creatures called velvets. So, uh, Richard's going down to London below to help Dor. He, he wants to help her survive, and to do that they have to find the angel Islington. And they have all these places that are puns on London place names, like Blackfriars. And this is a place where the where they actually there are flyers, friar, there are monks who are black, 
and then they are they're like really badass. They're like you know fighters, maybe uh, kind of ninja monks. They're fearsome anyway. So things like that. The Knight's Bridge instead of being a medieval knight, it's a bridge where the darkness of night will come and kill you if you're not careful. So it's it's a lot of fun. There's a um, female female warrior called Hunter, and she helps she helps guide Richard and Dor through London London below. But you really have to you really have to read it to experience it or or watch the miniseries. Definitely good. Uh, next one I'm going to talk about is by a writer who's not generally recognized as being literary. I don't care because I think he's really good and I think he deserves to be to be recognized as literary even though the, the kind of work he's done has largely would largely be considered kind of mercenary. The guy's name is Kevin J. Anderson and he has done a lot of of the Dune sequels, you know, since Herbert, the, Frank Herbert has been gone for many years, and uh, I think Herbert's son worked on them, but Kevin J. Anderson worked on a lot of them. He's worked on other, he's worked on other sequels of deceased authors, and been very prolific. But he's also been very into steampunk. I've got a book by him uh, about Captain Nemo, uh, kind of a sequel to Twenty Thousand Leagues, which I definitely need to read one of these days when I get time. But this project that I really love of his, which I consider to be literary, is called Clockwork Lives. It was a collaboration with the late great drummer from the rock, rock group Rush, one of my personal heroes, Neil Peart. And it was written in 2015, published by ECW Press. It's kind of a literary sequel to uh, Rush's last studio album, Clockwork Angels. And it's based on that idea of a steampunk world where it's ruled by this guy called the Watchmaker. And he kind of, he's not, he's despotic, but he's not all bad. And yet, and there's all these magical, mystical elements to it. Uh, there's airships and so on, and clockwork, of course. The clockwork angels are these uh, auto automata that he builds that uh, come out and make proclamations to the public. They're kind of like religious icons. So basically what they did is they made a series of interconnected stories based on the Rush album. And uh, as if, you, if you're a fan of Rush, you know that their, the, their albums were all very concept-oriented and that they would usually be connected and tell a story. The hero of Clockwork Lives is a woman named Miranda Peake. She's kind of the She's almost getting to be a spinster. She spent her whole life caring for ailing father, a famous alchemist who had just died, and she, she's you know kind of given up on her dreams. She she likes being content and you know quiet life, you know kind of like uh, Bilbo Baggins, <laughs> that kind of thing. But she discovers that her father's will says that he's got a vast treasure, but she can only inherit if she does this task, does this quest. She reluctantly answers the challenge, and it changes her life much for the better. So she's traveling around this world. This is a steampunk fantasy world. And she travels to the capital. She travels to the next continent. She meets all these fantastic people and, and has these amazing adventures. Each is kind of a story about a particular person that she meets. The whole point of it is that, that her father has left her this magical book that she has to fill in by uh, recording people's lives. Now, you would think that she could just talk to X number of people and it would fill up, but the point is that a lot of, most people's lives aren't very interesting, so you'll just get two paragraphs. But people who have done things, kind of like her father, will fill up, fill up several pages or even a chapter. So she has to meet people that are outstanding. So she goes out to meet the watchmaker and she meets the anarchist who, um, who is trying to overthrow the, the, the watchmaker's government. And she meets, you know, pirates and adventurers and even even finds love eventually. She meets a woman with a bookstore that can go between dimensions. Now she meets thieves and scoundrels. These are the people who, who uh, can fill up a lot of pages in her book which is kind of by magical ink. So she doesn't get to cheat and write a lot about a boring person. She has to meet interesting people. So that makes it very good. The audiobook version uh, including uh, has you know, Anderson and, and Pert reading it, and it's got a different author for every chapter, pretty much, and it's very good. 
a lot of eloquent language, a lot of, you know, meditations on life and what it means and what it means to live a good life. And even if the elites don't recognize this as, liter as literary, I think it is. So, the next one I have to mention, and I've, I've talked about this so many times, <laughs> unfortunately, but uh, it's really such, it's one of my favorite novels ever, The Night Circus by Aaron Morgenstern, 2011. And again, this is something that, yes, it's recognized by, by the, the academic, academic types. It's won a number of awards. It's considered, you know, historical fantasy, but it's very steampunk in its character. It was my number three pick for best all, all over uh, steampunk novels of all time. It's won like the Alex Award and the Locus Award and so on. It takes place mostly in Victorian London, though in other places. It involved the Circus of Dreams. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a magical circus that only appears from uh, dusk till dawn. The uh, color scheme is black and white, which is interesting. And although it appears like there's very feats of, feats of like the performers are very adept at, at um, deceiving, you know, at, at being uh, stage magicians, they really have real magic. And you can do wonderful things like climb through clouds when you're in the circus. You know, you pay your money, you go in, and at dawn it's all over, and then after a couple days, they disappear and go to another town, and nobody knows where they're going or why. The two primary characters are a young people, Celia, Bo Celia Bowen and uh, Marco Alistair. And they're essentially the protégés of two magicians who are actually real magicians. And one of them is Prospero the Great, and Celia is his illegitimate daughter. And the other is Mr. A.H., his mentor, who finds this uh, orphan, Marco, and who has magical talent. So they, it's a long going bet, which can become the greatest magician, and one's supposed to destroy the other. <laughs> but of course, being a romance, romantic novel, they fall in love. So they can't, one can't destroy the other. They both become involved with the Circus of Dreams, and they, because of the, the, in, the interference of these, of their of their mentors, you know, the circus, things start going wrong. Uh, and to the point where, you know, one of the performers decides that one of, one of the two has to die to keep the circus from being destroyed. And the circus is very important to her and all of them because its, it's magical abilities make them uh, age very slowly. They're, they're very long-lived. And they have also, they, there's clockwork involved. There's this magical clock at the, at the uh, entrance to the circus which can reconfigures itself over the, over the evening made by a master German clockmaker. So that's part of our steampunk element. And the book itself became kind of a cult classic. Just like in the, in the, in the novel, they, they, invent, they got cult, cult followers, kind of like deadheads in our day. They follow the circus around, they call themselves reviewers or dreamers They're because they follow the circus of dreams. And so I absolutely love this book. I, I hate to talk about it for the, like the fourth time, but it's worth it. So in summary, even if steampunk isn't considered to be very literary, even if, even if uh, our academia might look down on us, I think it, we proved that there are authors that have written steampunk and are writing steampunk that are of the literary quality, that do write the longer works with the more eloquent language, with the greater amount of symbolism and uh, metaphor and emotional content, as opposed to more like popular adventures. Not that there's anything wrong with popular adventures, I love them, and most steampunks would fit into that category. but. Steampunk does have its, uh, its literary merits as well. If you like this, please let me know. I'll, I eventually may do some more of this when I get around to it, more like this. I pr very much appreciate your, your comments below, or if you don't like it, also let me know. Please also like and subscribe because that helps us get out the good gospel of steampunk. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying, Adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.